sorry, I'm going to start that again. Hello, everyone from St. John's, Newfoundland uh, and Labrador. My name is Janet Heron, and I'm an alumni engagement officer at Memorial. And we are living through very strange days, as I said earlier, and now it's being recorded. At the Office of Alumni Engagement, we are focused on offering many ways for you to connect with Memorial from anywhere in the world. We are working diligently to create opportunities to celebrate, socialize, mentor, learn, and advance both your career and improve your lives. Embarking on new and exciting ways to build relationships within our memorial family of approximately 100,000 members is vital to our evolution as an institution. You, our alumni and friends, are our greatest ambassadors. You are a worldwide community of professionals, leaders, and change makers who advance the reputation of our university, our province, and our world. Please consider getting involved with our programming. We have mentoring opportunities with 10,000 coffees, opportunities to meet up with Newfoundland and Labrador expats through Global NL, and we have an online book club called Coastlines that is featuring Newfoundland and Labrador authors who are also Memorial alumni. You can find out more details about all of those initiatives on our website. Thank you for joining us at this event today. We are featuring Dr. Lisa Rankin and archaeology in the first of our HSS 101 series in partnership with the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. Our plan for this series is to introduce Memorial alumni and friends, whether they work in business, science, economics, or anything in between, to disciplines in the social sciences and humanities that offer insight on the evolution of human knowledge, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. I'll also be monitoring the Q&A function that you see on your screen. If you'd like to ask a question, you can type it in there. Please try to use the Q&A rather than the chat function, but I'll try to check both. Uh, Dr. Rankin will be answering as many questions as possible after her presentation. And please try to keep your questions short, under 250 characters. And uh, now that I have hit the recording button, we are recording this session. And so you will receive a link in the email uh, at, soon after this event if you'd like to watch it again. So it is my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Rankin. Dr. Rankin is a professor and Memorial University Research Chair of Northern Indigenous Community Archaeology. She holds a BA Honors in Anthropology from UBC, an MA from Trent, and a PhD from McMaster. We don't have time here to list all of Dr. Rankin's accomplishments, but one I would like to highlight is that she was the first person at Memorial to be awarded the Jeffrey Marshall Mentoring Award from the Northeastern Association of Graduate Schools, which includes the Ivy League schools, Princeton, Yale, and Harvard. She draws on the archeological remains of domestic settlements to understand power structures and relationships between individuals, communities, and cultures in the far Northeast. All of her research is undertaken at the invitation of Indigenous communities, and she has spent the last 20 years learning how to conduct this research in a more ethical and relevant manner for the Labrador Inuit communities that she works with. We've got a lovely quote from Eldridge Allen. I just want to read. He is the Inuk owner and pilot of Bird's Eye Inc., which is a drone company in Rigolet, Labrador. And Eldred says, Lisa Rankin has built a rapport in Northern Labrador communities based on her professional and passionate knowledge of the people and their ties to the rich archeological history in the area. It is easy to see how the residents of the communities and members of her archeological team all feel at ease with her professional presence. And this makes Lisa and her work an important part of the fabric of Labrador, both its present and past. So I'm going to hand the ball over to Lisa right now. I know we're having a little bit of connectivity just with Lisa's picture, but that should not be a problem for Lisa to give us the actual presentation. So I'm going to pass the ball over to Lisa. Okay, Lisa. Okay. There it comes. Right. And I'm going to get rid of my picture because you guys don't need to see my, me while Lisa's speaking. Okay. Yeah. 
and here we go. Hi, everybody. I hope you can see that now. Yeah, yeah. I can see you now. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming out to hear me give a very quick introduction to archaeology. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, 20 minutes is obviously not enough time to teach everybody about everything that we do in archaeology. So I have chosen today to talk about how some of the work that the Department of Archaeology at MUN links to contemporary issues in Newfoundland and Labrador picture of St. John's campus is here to remind me to talk about what is so special about Memorial University and its relationship to the people of the province. And that goes back to the mandate of the university, which holds a, a term that I don't think is common and maybe not even occurs at all at other universities, which built within our mandate is that we have a special obligation to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. Over time, I think this has meant many different things, but at its heart, I believe it means that we not only offer education to our to the people of the province, but that our research is of interest and of use to the people of the province. It's also about a way of democratizing knowledge that allows for community involvement, community direction, and allows communities to take ownership of the research. And in the Department of Archaeology, we've been involved in various community engaged projects um, over the years. And one of the very first, not undertaken by me, but on my, by my predecessor, Dr. James Tuck, um, were the excavations at the Red Bay Whaling Station. In the 16th century, Bass came to Red Bay Harbor to hunt whales and process their blubber into oil that could be used to, to light the streets of Europe. Archaeologists from Mun went to Red Bay in the late 70s, and over the course of 15 years, they worked with community members, Parks Canada, and Parks Canada to develop the site, both by initially offering jobs to community members, um, but really over the years, it developed more into promoting the site as a tourism destination, which would also help to build a local economy. And ultimately, as you can see from this slide, uh, it resulted in a UNESCO heritage designation, which now affords the site to draw many thousands of tourist visitors each year. And lots of uh, business opportunities have opened up around that because of course those tourists need accommodations and places to get food and they want to visit other sites. Uh, so it's really a use of archeology span that has helped communities in Southern Labrador to survive, I would say. A more recent uh, example of this is the colony of Avalon, which began as an archaeological pro uh, project, again under Jim Tuck, but is now led by Dr. Barry Galkin, one of my colleagues. Um, in 1992, as a response to the Cod Moratorium, when the community of Fairyland was really in trouble, the jobs were gone, people didn't know what they were going to do. And so the excavation was started. It used uh, community members um, as the excavators and ideas were put into motion about what the colony of Avalon could become. Could we build a museum? Um, could there be tours for people? Could there be a gift shop? And in 1994, uh, the local community took complete ownership of Fairyland starting the Colony of Avalon Foundation and now Fairyland runs everything that goes on there. My own uh, entrance into community archaeology was not immediate. I arrived 20 years ago at Memorial University um, from away and was given a task of developing new research in Newfoundland and Labrador. I chose to go to Labrador because Mun hadn't been doing much work there for a while. I was really interested in engaging with people, but I had never been taught how to do it and I wasn't sure how to go about it. And it just sort of happened naturally. I became very good friends with people in the community of Cartwright, which was the closest community I was working to. 
And, uh, and then I had this encounter with this particular um, Inuit site that you can see on your screen now. This is a, a, a six, late 16th century Inuit occupation. Up towards the top of the screen, you see a long, narrow entrance into a, a, a bigger area down near the bottom of the screen, which would have been the, the floor of the house. We excavated this house and people suddenly became very, very interested. And this is because at the time that I was working there, what was what is now Nunatu Havut, the Southern Inuit, um, were beginning to engage in the process of getting federal recognition as an indigenous an indigenous status. And they had um, lots of stories and genealogies and lots of family history, but the federal government was looking for other kinds of data that demonstrated that they had a long history in the region um, that could be con connected to the communities that live there now. So when we found this Inuit house, it was the first one um, in the area that people knew about. Archaeologists had begun to speculate that there were more, but we really hadn't found any. And uh, Nuna Tulwit members rallied around it, and we developed a project together to do some more archaeological work to help them in their endeavors. So this, I think, is 2007, maybe. We gathered all of the archaeological heritage uh, people that had some interest in that part of Labrador, along with uh, a lot of members of Nuna Tuhavut. We had a big meeting in Cornerbrook. And over the course of two or three days, we laid out some priorities for what was needed. Basically, Nuna Tuhavut needed to find more archaeological sites uh, to demonstrate their the length of their history in the region. Um, and, and, you know, it, we have to put some blame on archaeology here because it looked like there was no, from an academic perspective, it looked like there was no um, Inuit history, largely because we hadn't looked and found the sites prior to this time. And so there was a big gap on the map, um, which made it look like Inuit presence really stopped around Rigla. So we decided that we would do a big survey, and if we found sites, we would do excavation. But I also wanted, I was terrified. It was my first endeavor into community archaeology, and I kept thinking, what if we don't find anything? There has to be some other outcomes for the community. So we, we settled on a variety of different types of things that you know, two of it wanted. They wanted to be recognized in um, social studies textbooks that kids were using. They wanted uh, things like movies that could be put out there so that the rest of Canada could learn about their culture. So we built a variety of different options uh, into our work plan and then we sat down and we applied for a giant grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Council of Canada. They gave uh, our team, which was eight researchers and multiple members of the Nuna Tuhavut community, a million dollars and five years to do what we could. Um, and we did go about making movies. Uh, we made two movies in all. Uh, People of Nuna Tuhavut was the bigger, splashier movie that played on CBC, and you can still watch it online now at CBC. Uh, which laid out the history of the community. But we also did lots of archaeology. We did lots of survey work and we did in fact find sites. I had been so worried about finding these Inuit sites. The president of Nunatu Havut um, back then, Chris Montague, took me aside after our big meeting and said, don't worry, Lisa, we know who we are and we know where we came from. And I should have just listened to him and not been such stressed out about it because we found a lot of sites. Uh, just in the one bay that I was working in, we found about 30 or 35 sites and we excavated many of them. And we excavated them with youth from the communities. It's just a, an example of some of the many Inuit houses all dating to different time periods that we found. We could trace Inuit settlement from about 1590 right up until into the 1900s. And then, of course, contemporary um, uh, history takes over. There's lots of evidence from that. 
These are some of the kinds of artifacts that we found on those sites. They include European objects. There's a, a sword hilt off to the left, some coins and beads. Um, and these are indications that early Inuit and Southern Labrador were really interacting with the annual fishermen that would come from Europe to the Straits. But lots of traditional artifacts too. Uh, the item on the top is a, a multi-component item that is used to cut the sods that would cover the roofs of these houses to keep them warm in the winter time. Uh, the item on the bottom left is a trace buckle for running dogs and of course, um, an item for hunting here. All of our excavations, and, and remember I, I said there were eight researchers working on this, so not just mine, but the excavations and the research work being done by the whole team uh, was immediately posted to a website that we created. Uh, Vince Walsh from the Maritime History Archive developed it for us, and we were posting images from the field. So getting our data into the communities even before we had much time to assess what it was. Uh, and then we would go back and, and post all of our reports and all of our publications on this on this website as well. And it was tremendously popular in the new Natuavut community. In the height of the project, we were getting about 2,000 hits a month on this website, almost all of them coming from Labrador. But we did other things, as we said we would. We uh, got the people into the textbooks in Newfoundland and Labrador. We went into high schools and brought uh, videos and recording equipment and editing equipment and worked with the graduate classes so that they would learn how to make movies about identity and about growing up in Southern Labrador and about what mm, being members of Nunatuhavu meant to them. We made place maps for all of the local restaurants in Southern Labrador to use based on the artifacts that we were finding. And my favorite thing that happened was just the joy and the pride that I would see in the communities that this work was done about their history. So every year we would hold a, a big barbecue day, we would provide gas money and um, invite all of the community members out and people would show up in their boats all day long. It was not unusual to some of these islands that we were working on doing the excavations that we would get between 100 and 200 people visit us and often spend much of the day um, reminiscing about how they had used that particular landscape themselves in the past and the connections of those early Inuit whose homes we were looking at to their lives now. More recently, once the Nunatuavut project was over, um, I began collaborating with Nunatsiavut on a variety of different projects. I worked predominantly with the communities of Rigolette and Hopedale, and that work is actually ongoing. It has been um, impacted slightly by COVID, so we were unable to get there last year, and we still don't know what's going to happen for this year. Uh, but the two projects in the two communities were largely related to tourism. The Nunatsiavut government had asked each of the five constituent uh, Inuit communities uh, in Nunatsiavut to develop their own research strategy, um, excuse me, tourism strategy. This was based largely on the fact that they were getting more and more tourists each year, either going to the national parks, um, which border in Nunatsiavut or um, coming in on, on small expedition cruise ships. And so they were asked to think about how they might want to integrate tourism into their communities. And several of these communities decided that archeology span would be part of their tourism strategy. And they wanted archeology span that would focus on the Inuit history so that they could develop stories uh, to discuss with the tourists, which really connected their past and their ancestors to their present lifestyles in these communities. In Rigolette, their approach was very interesting. 
They began by constructing an eight kilometer long boardwalk. It's a beautiful boardwalk that takes you all along uh, the, the ocean from the community of Rigolet, uh, eight kilometers to a destination. And the destination is an archeological site called the Double Mare Point site. And they asked us to come in and excavate the site for them because their hope was to reconstruct the site so that they could have um, their own students go out to interpret that for tourists that would come in. Uh, so we did excavate it and we're continuing to excavate it today. Again, we did this with MUN students and with local students from the community of Rigolets. There are three beautiful houses here, which we excavated. The community of Rigolet gave us access to a beautiful museum space that's right on their wharf called the Net Loft to use as our lab, where we would take our artifacts back each day to catalog them and clean them. But the wonderful thing, there's always great things that happen in these projects that you're really not expecting. And the wonderful thing to me was that the net loft became this real um, interesting point of contact in the community. People would come in every day to see what kinds of artifacts we were getting, and they would sit and tell stories about these artifacts. And so we had inadvertently created a place where elders from the community could talk to the archeologists, but also talk to the youth that were working with us about what the artifacts were, how they were used, what life on the land was like, what life was like before all the modern things that we have now. And it was a great place for knowledge exchange between all of us. These are just a few of the kinds of artifacts that came out of that beautiful site. Um, on the left, there are artifacts of, of European origin that date to the War of 1812. And these were mixed in with artifacts of more traditional value for Inuits. Uh, these are objects that are carved out of ivory and were probably part of a shaman's belt at one time. They also asked us to do other things like create signage for the site. So this is a, a, a recent plaque that we've done. It's about, I guess, three feet long, something that you would typically see at a historic site. Uh, in Inuktitut in English, and this is posted at the site now at the end of the boardwalk for when people walk out there and there's nobody out there to give them a tour. We had a visit from the Aboriginal People's Television Network. They spent almost two weeks with us working at the site, doing a documentary on us for a show called Wild Archaeology. And this, is a, this show is very, very popular on APTN, but I understand that it was also very popular in the community of Rigolette too. We did another website, this time a Facebook site, uh, called Rigolette Community Archaeology, where we post all of our artifacts. We post uh, everything that we learn about them, all of the different processes that the artifacts have to go through in the lab to stabilize them so that people know what's happening all the time. And it has been a great success. And we have a little bit more to excavate there. And I'm really hoping that we'll be able to get back there soon. Now, the community of Hopedale heard about what we were doing in Rigolette through a presentation that I gave. And they approached me uh, as soon as I finished presenting, actually, and asked me if I had any interest in coming to their community. Um, you can see that, that Hopedale has these beautiful Moravian buildings that are in this picture, um, they were thinking about making their own application to UNESCO to become a World Heritage Site. And these buildings, the Moravian buildings, would definitely be part of it. But they also wanted the Inuit history to be part of it as well. And Hopedale itself is built on top of a very large 16th to 18th century Inuit community a place where people would go every year to meet Inuit families from all over for the purpose of whaling and seeing their, their friends and their relatives and having lots of ceremonies, probably even marriages and things took place. So that left us with a really interesting position that was a little bit different than what we experienced in Rigolette. 
which was that we were excavating within the community itself. We, we weren't outside at all. Um, so we were having to ask people to move their skidoos and their comatics so we could put uh, excavation units in to try and find bits of the site. But they also asked us, based on the success that we'd had at the lab in Riglet, if we would do work with commit with kids, particularly interested in having knowledge exchange between elders and youth. And they also gave us a beautiful building to put our lab in, um, one of the old Moravian buildings. But after a few days, we realized that nobody was coming. Things weren't happening the same way that they were in Riglet. The community of Hopedale was a different community. And then we found out slowly that a lot of people thought that the building that we were doing our lab in was haunted. So we had to go out from that space and into the communities and find other ways of engaging youth and elders around the idea of archaeology. Um, so we started taking it, the kids out to do lots of different kinds of projects that would bring them in contact with elders. We developed a movie series which the kids uh, film and edit uh, one movie, at least one movie, sometimes three movies for each season. And we have a YouTube channel that all of the, the youth that work with us post their movies on at the end of each summer. These have become really well loved now. Um, the elders are amazed by how much they're learning about technology from the youth. And the youth are amazed by how much they're learning about life and being in it from their elders. Our students are working on these projects as well, our MUN students. So it's not just me that's running things by any means. Uh, this is a picture of one of my PhD students, Dr. Uh, Michelle Davies, who is working in Hebron with Hebron descendants. Michelle had been uh, working for the Nunatsiavut Government Archaeology Office for a while. And in getting to know people in name, realized how difficult it was for Hebron descendants and how much they missed their home, even if they weren't born there, if they had generations later, they still felt a real connection to Hebron. So she has attempted for her PhD to design a project that will take Hebron descendants back to the Hebron community every year, usually a family or two at a time, uh, the initial idea was that they would excavate some of the old households of these families, but as people got on the land, they decided that they didn't want to do this. They didn't want to disturb those sites. So the project has become about mapping the community, um, getting everybody's input who, who has a connection to the community about who lived where, where their fishing camps were, where they went and got berries, um, and also collecting artifacts that are on the surface in hopes of developing a, an exhibit that will be somewhere in the Hebron Moravian buildings. Um, Michelle has left that position now and is in the course of writing up her PhD. And one of the lovely things about this project is the Nunatsiavut government is going to continue the project. And so Nunatsiavut has taken ownership of the archeology span and the project itself, which is exactly how these things should run. Now, to kind of wrap things up, um, we're facing a new problem in archaeology in Newfoundland and Labrador, and it's going to involve not just the archaeologists uh, from the Department of Archaeology, but communities all over the province, and that's climate change. So you can see here this image of Fairyland uh, underwater due to storm surge. Uh, the beaches sites in Bonavista Bay is being encroached by rising sea levels. Um, at Avialic in northern Labrador, the site is beginning to slump because the permafrost that holds the site together is uh, deteriorating as the climate warms. And even here close to town, um, we see the Torres Cove Cemetery, which is beginning to erode down the cliffside. So these are huge problems that we have to figure out a way to deal with because archaeology has become such a huge component of tourism in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. And it's also something that local communities take great pride in 
because it's an expression of their history. COVID is playing a deterring role in us getting on with this work at the moment. We were very, very lucky last, last spring to have been awarded a substantial grant um, from the Canada Foundation of Innovation to buy all new equipment for the department that we could go out and start to monitor sites, uh, find the ones that are in the biggest danger and sort of develop a triage plan what kinds of sites we're willing to let go, what must be saved, what needs excavation. But we can't do any of that work until we know what the communities want us to do. And this is particularly relevant to, our, to uh, the Indigenous communities in the province because most of the sites that are threatened, and we're talking probably about 90% of the archaeological sites in Newfoundland and Labrador, but many of the sites um, are of Indigenous ancestry. And so we really need to discuss with the various Indigenous groups what they would like done with these sites. And until we can get out in the field and start doing the work and using the new equipment that we have, I've spent part of the winter talking to groups like Nuna Tuhalut about um, how we develop citizen science archaeology, uh, get, getting youth involved in going out and monitoring the sites that we know about and seeing how they're holding up over the the course of big summers and long winters um, to keep an eye on things until we can start making those decisions. But that's what we're facing now. So it's a big community project, one that takes in the whole province. And I guess that's everything I wanted to say to you. I hope that's given you a little bit of an introduction into how archaeology um, at Memorial University influences contemporary life in the province. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. I am just going to take the ball back from Lisa. I think I am. Hold on one second, everyone. Um, okay. I think I could do it this way. No, I can't. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, we can still, we can talk without doing that. I don't know why I can't take the ball back from you. Maybe I'll figure that out in a second. Um, we've got questions. So thank you very much for that, Lisa. Uh, we do have questions and uh, we're gonna start with, can you just clarify uh, when you say Southern Inuit, does that mean Southern Labrador? That's from Jamie Gillingham. He's wondering about that. Um, the Southern Inuit are Inuit that live south of Nunatsiavut. Uh, the really from the Happy Valley Goose Bay region south down towards the Straits. Yes. Great. Great. Uh, Peggy Dixon is asking, I was wondering how you were able to develop the close relations with the communities in terms of language. Did the youth translate or did all of the elders speak English or did you have to learn the community language? Um, for the most part, the exchanges were in English, but particularly in Hopedale, there has been quite a wonderful program in Inuktitut in the high school. And so the students that we were working with from the local high school were getting better and better at Inuktitut um as we were progressing through our years there and could have small conversations with the elders in Inuktitut. Wonderful. Um Minnie Merkuaksuk, and I apologize for the pronunciation, she wants to know what you did in Nain and also if you found anything interesting in Nain. I haven't done any work in Nain at all. Um, because Nain is the office of, uh, because the Nunatsiavut government archaeologists are housed in Nain, they do most of the work that is there. One of my colleagues, Peter Whitridge, uh, has done some work in the Nain area as well, and he's involved local youth in his uh, excavations but I'm not completely certain what they've been working on. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, Joseph Lafitte wants to know what the priority plans are for the next number of years in archaeology. It's it's really about climate change. Um, it's going to be absolutely devastating to the archaeological sites in in the province. This is largely because most of the sites are located oceanside. They're on recent or near recent beaches. And that means that they're on sand as well. So when we get sea level rise combined with storm surge, those sites are all immediately impacted. They lose sand, they shift, they get taken out to sea. And so what we're trying to do, uh, both Nunatsiavut and Nunatuhavut have created climate strategies. They are working on getting monitoring equipment. They're going to work with the archaeologists to learn how to use the equipment um, and, and keep track of sites that are very important to them. At the same time, we know that there's a lot of sites we don't even know about yet. So we need to do mass survey work using things like drones and ground penetrating radar, which mean we can get data on sites without actually having to excavate them, which is a very lengthy process. Um, and find the sites and then talk with the communities about which will take priority for them. What kinds of information you want to know about your past? Uh, are they in good places to have um, tourist sites, those different kinds of things. All of those conversations are going to have to play into it. And together, we're going to have to come up with a plan for how to preserve some of the sites, excavate others, and just let others, unfortunately, go. Um, we've got a couple of questions here from Ann Colburn, who uh, says she loves the work you're doing with Labrador communities. She used to work as a traveling doctor on the Labrador coast and is still connected with a network of the Grenfell Health Service alumni, which is wonderful. So two part question. I am curious as to how an archaeologist chooses the site for a dig. Are there any factors which increase the likelihood that a site will yield positive results? Hmm. Um, yes, I suppose there are. Uh, so when we're out looking for sites, we find them largely because there's something about that area that doesn't look completely natural. Um, high stands of uh, very fertile grasses and wildflowers, for example, can demonstrate that the soil in an area is particularly organic. And it's probably that way because humans were using it. They were also using it as a toilet. <laughs> so, um, and they were processing animals and all of those different things which make for very rich soils. Uh, and so the bigger the stands of those things, probably the bigger the site. But it's also really influenced over what you're trying to find. And so I could go out today and, and take a wander around and probably find two or three archaeological sites in an afternoon just about anywhere in the province. But if I'm looking for uh, Inuit sites in particular, I'm going to be looking for certain kinds of harbors, um, certain kinds of beaches, uh, places where there's good access to seal or to char. Uh, so you need to know about how people live and what they think is important to kind of help you find these sites. The other problem that we have in Newfoundland and Labrador is that soils tend to be quite acidic, which means that uh, artifacts disintegrate quite quickly. And so we're often left with things that are made out of rock, which doesn't give us the full range of what people were using in their day to day lives. Uh, however, a lot of people who a lot of coastal people rely a lot on shellfish. And so uh, as the shells deteriorate in those sites, they kind of work against the acidity of the soil and help preserve artifacts. So sites with lots of shells are always great things to look for. Great. Sorry, I'm going to go back to the, the chat. Um, 
we've got lots of questions too. So everyone, I hope if we can get to them all, uh, we I'm going to see if Lisa might be able to answer them uh, and on a, uh, afterwards, and then we can send them out to you. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Megan D wants to know what would you consider your favorite parts of field work? Um, I love being out on the land. Uh, so one of the really nice things about working in Labrador is that I, and it's also a bit of a frustrating thing because I'm away from my family, but I, I'm gone and we're camping and for six to eight weeks, I get to live in a beautiful natural environment. Um, you also become really good friends and colleagues with the people that are working with you. Uh, and so some probably all of my very best friendships have been forged in those situations where you're where you're out on the land together in a small group for a few weeks. Um, so I considered those parts of the work as equally as important to me as finding things because it's about developing relationships with people in the contemporary world and talking about what you think about the past. Great. Derek Strong wants to know, do you use metal detectors or ground penetrating radar? Uh, yes. Now, I, I have only just begun to use ground penetrating radar. I've never used a metal detector at all, uh, though I know some archaeologists that do. Um, we have a capacity for a ground penetrating radar in our department. And one of the projects that we used it on over the last couple of years was in Hopedale, actually. They had, the community of Hopedale had asked us to um, try and find all of the burials in the Moravian Cemetery that was in the community, because they knew that over the course of the last couple of hundred years, many of the headstones had deteriorated or were removed. And they wanted to know how to mark those graves and how to celebrate them, particularly as they're thinking of this UNESCO bid. Um, so we used ground penetrating radar over the course of two summers to locate all of the burials. Cool. cool. Uh, Michelle Davio wants to know, in the houses you excavated, were you able to identify activity areas? Yes, absolutely. Inwood houses, uh, uh, tend to have very specific places where things are done. So you come up those long entrance passages and into the house, and usually to the right or the left, there'll be a little node, which is a clear cooking area. It may have um, a soapstone oil lamp still there, but if not, it's usually splattered with seal fat so that you know cooking was going on there. There may be um, uh, animal bones scattered around that area from where they being where they were being cut up and, and used to, to make soups and stews. Uh, and then around the sides of the walls inside the houses are things that we call benches or sleeping platforms. And these are, are really our low benches around the walls where people would sit and they would carry out daily chores. A lot of sewing and a lot of beating went on through the winters um, from those benches. And so we find a lot of remains of of women's activities. Interesting. Uh, Eric uh, would like to know, I was wondering if Dr. Rankin or any of her colleagues are interested in walls and circle structures found in Notre Dame Bay. Many of these are known, many are not, and we have found many. So I guess he's an amateur archeologist out there in the <laughs> Notre Dame Bay. <laughs> We're interested in everything. <laughs> we just need to, to learn about it. Great. So shoot Lisa an email and let her know about that. <laughs> email the archaeology department. Uh, Joseph Lafitte, I think he had a question earlier. What was the nature of the housing being found, semi-permanent or transitory? I was surprised that there were long-term housing in the communities. I thought most would have been transitory in nature. Um, generally, with, with Inuit uh, settlements, you get winter settlements and summer settlements, and sometimes those are right beside each other. So uh, the types of houses that I showed pictures of were all winter houses with big stone floors. They would have had 
um, either timber or whalebone used as supports for the roof, and then they'd be covered in hides and skins, and then blocks of sod put over the tops of those to keep them nice and toasty warm during the winter time. Um, and those would have been occupied for several months. And during the winter, people, it, it, it did make for easy travel on comatics and such, but these were home bases that people would come back to. Uh, so that while they might go out for hunting, they would come back to these places. In the summer, um, it, they moved out of what we call sod houses, these winter sod houses, and moved into tents. And tents that I've found to date tend to be on points of land where it's really windy, likely to get out of the flies. Uh, and they leave a lot smaller archaeological footprint. They're much harder to see. Um, than the winter houses. It might have moved more frequently in the summer um, to nicer places to live. And so we don't find as many artifacts in them. Uh, but the winter houses would have been returned to year after year and just fixed up so they can be quite big. Great. Um, I think Ian Wheeler is uh, is interested in wanting to know if there's any way alumni can get involved in this research, or can you volunteer at an archaeological site? Absolutely. There's all kinds of ways to get involved in the research. Um, it, if you're close by, there's always research going on in our labs because it, excavation takes place in the summer, but a lot of figuring out what we found goes on over the winter, and there's always need for people to help us in lab settings. Uh, close to town, um, there are uh, programs for volunteering at places like Fairyland, and uh, further afield, uh, like my projects in Labrador, I would absolutely be interested in volunteers as well, uh, but I have some restrictions on that in terms of uh, you really have to get along well with with the Inuit communities <laughs> and you have to be comfortable sleeping in a tent and being um, on the land for long periods of time. Fair enough. Um, Dorothy Basque wants to know, wants you to describe, if you could, what the houses look like. She said, it looks like the excavated houses have stone flooring. Yes. Yeah, so that's all you were seeing in those pictures of the excavations. They did have stone floors. So they uh, excavated into the ground, um, maybe as much as a meter. Uh, and then, so you end up with this sort of big bowl shape, and then they would lay uh, flat stones to make a floor. They would then mound up earth around all the edges and put more flat stones on those mounds to create benches around the sides. Um, and then if you can sort of imagine whale bones, how they curve, being used as a superstructure, covered by hides and skins, and then covered by sods. And the entrance into the house would have been um, basically an underground tunnel that you crawled through and then stepped up into the house in because that tunnel would keep all the cold air out and any warm air that rises would rise into the house. So they would be nice and warm inside. Um, I've got a couple of questions here from Megan D, who sounds like she's interested in archaeology as a career. She says, what parts of archaeology were the reasons you became interested in it and going into it as a career? And it's kind of a two-part question. What would your advice be for someone planning to go into the archaeology program at MUN? Um, wow. I always knew I wanted to be an archaeologist. I can't remember not wanting to be an archaeologist. Um, I My reasons for enjoying it have changed a lot between, you know, the age of 10 and, and now. Um, at first, it was about adventure. And uh, as I got more and more involved, I got involved in archaeology as a high school student, volunteering on projects in Ontario. 
Um, and then as I got more involved in university archaeology, I liked the thought that I could take the skills that I had acquired and use them anywhere in the world, and that it would be a springboard for travel for me. Um, and then the older I got, it was more and more about connecting with communities and making sure that um, the work that was being done was the kind of work that they wanted to do, wanted to have done, that it told the stories they were interested in, um, and, th and that it was useful and important for them because it's most of the archaeology, certainly not all of the archaeology I've done, but most of the archaeology I do, I have done in uh, and with Indigenous communities. And um, I have just learned so much, and that is the most exciting part for me now, I think, is is learning from the communities that I work with. Um, I think we have time maybe for a couple more questions. Uh, Joy Blunden wants to know if you have an engagement strategy or a framework that is used for starting projects with new communities. <laughs> Not anymore, really, um, because the work that I've done now, I've been doing it for so long, I just tend to get invited. Will you come work on this next? Will you come work on that next? Um, and so that's the way my career has evolved over the last, particularly the last 15 years. Um, what I would say is that there is no one plan that will work everywhere for doing community engaged research. Every community is different. They have different priorities, different ways of viewing the world. Um, and so even though I might come with a plan, like I, I had an idea of what worked in Rigolette with the, with the lab and it becomes such a social fun space and, and a way to you know exchange knowledge between all different generations. Well, that didn't work when I got to Hopedale. We had to think on our feet and really change things. So I think that you come with goals but you have to be completely and entirely prepared that your plan will be different the week after you arrive. <laughs> to use that overused word, you have to be able to pivot. <laughs> pivot, pivot, that's what we do. Pivot. Um, I've got one question I really wanna ask and I, 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 and this is gonna, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't, but I really, I'm interested. I mean, this Netflix movie, The Dig, has been explosive <laughs> and people have just really, it must be a boon for archaeology departments. Uh, but I just wonder if you can comment on the reaction to that movie among, among non-archaeologists and why you think it struck such a chord with people. It's a lovely little movie. It has it has flaws that as archaeology the archaeology community has been discussing at at a certain amount of length since it premiered. But at the same time, I think we all enjoyed it. It's a lovely, quiet movie, and some of the things that it did really nicely. Um, one to shift the focus to the local excavator archaeologist and away from the ivory tower archaeologists. So there's so many people that contribute to archaeology and have done over hundreds of years that just never, um, never get the glory, I suppose, never get recognized for their contributions. So it was really nice to see a movie that said, hey, there's a lot that went into this magnificent excavation that never would have been done if it wasn't for this local man. That was a really nice thing to see, but I think more importantly, the theme of the movie that life is transitory, but there's this ongoing connection between the past and the present and that nothing's ever really forgotten. Um, yeah, that's close to all of us right now, particularly since we're living in such crazy times and it's a nice thought to hold on to. It is, it is. Well, I, I think we'll leave it there. Um, uh, I, we were getting lots of comments to thank you so much for this wonderful talk and thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Rankin for making time today to share her discipline with us. Thank you to all of you out there for attending and for your questions. 
Um, if you enjoyed today's event, our next HSS 101 session is going to be held on March the 23rd at 1 p.m. And we are going to feature three faculty members. We'll see how that works uh, from our gender studies department. So we're looking forward to that. And that's going to be followed by folklore and religious studies. Uh, you can find the link to register on our alumni engagement website. Uh, so uh, that is it. As I indicated earlier, this session has been recorded and I will be sharing a link in an upcoming email. So please keep your eyes on your inbox. Thanks again. And in the words of our amazing chief medical officer, Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, hold fast everyone. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thanks, Janice. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Thank you.